and instead is just a shadow profiled by the purple glowing white sparks of the electricity sent through it by the metal plate. In these low amplitude long exposure Corellian photos of a key, a leaf, a starfish, and a coin, we see the different forms of aura or energy field each emits. The key glows a dark red, the living leaf is silhouetted by a dark blue halo. The starfish's spines emit the same effect as the leaf, a halo of blue sparks, while the coin emits a pale red glow uniformly from its flat surface. Because in Curlian photos, both living and non-living objects appear to emit an electrical aura indicative of what has been implied as a soul, it is important to understand the distinct differences in traits of these auras to be able to, by looking at a Corellian photo of any object, determine if the object was alive or dead when the photo was taken. As mentioned before, a low amp, long exposure of the soul of a living object can appear similar to the high amp, short exposure of the soul of a dead object. Consider this high amp short exposure Corellian photo of a Celtic cross. As one runs a high voltage of electrical current through an inanimate object, it does appear to take on the same essential characteristic traits as exhibited by a low voltage applied over a longer duration to a living object. Their similarities are only illusory, however, in light of the fact that metal, despite magnetic shadowing, does not retain enough semblance of an electrical charge after the current applied to it is removed for it to be considered an animate, self-electrifying object. It is this self-electrification, defining living as opposed to inanimate objects, that is shown in Corellian photos. Second form of photography making use of the same essential method of technology as the Corellian metal plate designs, but measuring only the electrical transduction between five small metal circles and the tips of a person's fingers, shows us more minute differences in the aggregate charge of sparks exchanged between the fingertips and the charged metal as differences along the seven color spectrum reflecting, essentially, our mood at the time of the photo. We see here the simulated colors of her fingertips, amplified charges, shown projected onto an image of the person taking the picture, thus effectively depicting the aura of the person. The usual interpretation of the seven chakras attribution to the seven color spectrum applies in the interpretation of the colors simulated in these photos. If the electrical charge emitted from the body is strongly positive, the aura appears blue. If the electrical charge emitted from the body is strongly negative, the aura appears red. If the mood of the person is neither sad nor angry, their energy is neutral and appears green. In this form of depiction, our aura can appear as only one color, or as many different colors. The placement of colors in the different areas of our auras depicts the difference in electrical transduction between our different fingertips. There are, thus, five areas of the aura, each area of which can be one of seven colors. When these five areas are all the same color, it signifies the alignment of the chakras, or that there is harmony of the same mood throughout the whole organism. When these five areas are not all one color, but each one different, it signifies the disalignment of the chakras, such that a being is restless or dissatisfied, or that their feelings at the time of the photo were mixed. Modern Science, Part 1C, The Altered Psyche Although pagan shamans have used drugs to induce trance-meditative mind states since before the beginning of recorded history, modern civilization opposes their use in favor of artificial methods of inducing correspondent experiences. The field studying the potential 
of the human psyche for psychic and even psychokinetic power is called parapsychology in modern science. We see here a subject under testing during a Gansfeld experiment, such as those developed by Wolfgang Metzger in the 1930s. The eyes are covered with gauze, or in more modern use, one half each of a ping pong ball, so that the red light projected on them appears as opaque as possible. Also, headphones can be used to play sounds into the subject's ears, usually of white or pink static sounds created from phasing two or more regularly pulsed signals of offset polarities. This experiment, used to test a subject for aptitude at remote viewing, was based on earlier studies done using sensory deprivation. The psychological effects of sensory deprivation are similar to those experienced using natural drugs. In short doses, sensory deprivation is relaxing and conducive to meditative mind states. In long or forced doses, sensory deprivation induces extreme anxiety, hallucinations, bizarre paranoias, and depression. Sensory deprivation is usually performed in a hermetically sealed tank, allowing in no external light, and partially filled with warm water, in which the subject then floats asleep, meant to mimic the conditions of an unborn fetus inside a womb. The effect sensory deprivation was originally designed to test, and which occurs for the mind state of a person during meditation or on natural drugs, is called an out-of-body experience, or astral travel. Although no scientific experiments have been conducted to confirm the validity of such claims as made by shaman from ancient to modern times, by projecting the mind outside the body and manifesting it into a new body, one can literally be in two places at once. The mind, after leaving the body, can move like a ghost in a lucid dream, passing through objects or moving them, reading minds or possessing them, and knows no confines based on gravity. As this mind state is practiced, the details one can experience will become more vivid and realistic, and as this occurs it becomes possible to begin to narrow them down to only the most probable scenarios at specific target locations, and thus to remote view. The results of scientific experiments meant to mimic the mind states of shaman can only uncover for us all using artificial machines what is already known to the shaman themselves using drugs. Thus, though we can await the responses from their mechanical tests to verify them, we can predict the results of any form of psi or parapsychology experiment easily enough by relating it to a comparable form of mind state experienced by a shaman on drugs. As the concept of natural shamanism has declined from favor with civilization's technological progress, the ancient shaman, tribal medicine man, has resorted to isolated self-expression of their trance states to feed themselves individually and their social role is now seen as almost entirely in the realm of aesthetics. In this lithograph by Albert Dürer, we see the Angel of Melancholy, showing us the usual mind state of such a shaman, caged in a civilization that does not value them. In the so-called X-ray style of psychedelic art by modern shaman Alex Gray, we see the terrible anguish of the artist, shaman, who undergoes the extreme passions of the bipolarity between emotional highs and lows as they are crushed beneath the psychic gravity of their own self-destruction by the cosmic demiurge. Feeling down in the dumps, or having the blues, seems almost comical from the point of view of someone who is not experiencing it for themselves. However, from the point of view of anyone who has ever suffered what Shakespeare in Hamlet called the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, there is no more painful weight to bear than the desperate emptiness of a broken heart. 
the breaking point of a subject of parapsychological or MK research comes due to the induction of the same effect called by the depressed person hitting rock bottom. This occurs when external stressors are too strong for the nervous system to handle, and it blacks out and restarts itself. Depression is a sticky foe, since the more one focuses on it, the more enmeshed in it one becomes. Because of this, from the point of view of a shaman, most people live somewhere between a condition of melancholy and anguish in a state of perpetual depression. However, only those who hit rock bottom can break out above the lowest levels of sorrow to experience any real form of high spirits. The first and most obvious form of escape from sorrow is through sex. Sex, while on psychosomatically experience-enhancing drugs, allows one's mind state to enter a realm that cannot be achieved by an individual while in sensory deprivation. The earliest Tibetan Buddhists classified sex as Tantra, meant to be practiced only by a devout adherent to the Eightfold Path of Dharma. The practice of sex while on a hallucinogen, such as the Soma of the Tibetan Buddhists, is thus meant by the Buddhist shaman to be confined to only those who have undergone prior testing of themselves to determine their motives in pursuing it. This caveat is, however, sadly all too often overlooked by Western cult practitioners. The ultimate result of all forms of meditation, drug-induced, machine-induced, by choice or enforced, etc., for any individual, either alone or conjoined with another, is to see God. There has long been an argument between purist scientists and naturalist shaman over how many gods there are. The purist scientists believe there are two, the true God achieved through prayer and clean living, and the devil who deceives drug users into hallucination in his embrace. Naturalist shaman believe there to be only one true God, who both they and purists alike must all answer to in the end. While purist scientists struggle to reunify their interior selves with their exteriorized concept of God using artificial, sterile laboratory means, naturalist shaman have long ago dissolved the boundary of their ego between the God within and the God beyond themselves. The naturalist shaman believes all is God. Because all pre-scientific studies of all modern fields of science were once unified under a single concept, metaphysics, and because this concept was studied solely by naturalist shaman until purist science divided from them, it is often associated with mysticism. However, the complex pantheons, metaphors for cosmology, of all ancient cultures especially those which evolved into vast empires, were all originally discovered by mystic shaman, and all reflect symbolically as gods the same forces and interactions nowadays studied solely by purist scientists. In truth, there is only one universe which we all live within and experience, regardless of the belief that drugs delude the mind, and when one focuses their concentration on determining the nature of reality, whether on mind-expanding drugs or using purely scientific instruments, one will always be learning more about its true and real form. The true nature of God is such that the mind or imagination constitutes a superlayer surrounding above and around the outside of reality or the cosmos. When our own mind leaves the confines of its body, or is forced out suddenly, as with a near-death experience, we ascend upward and outward through this superlevel to exit the reality of this cosmos. Because some energy is left behind within the body, and because some more energy is left behind in the superlevel of the soul, and more energy dissipates as we exit this realm and enter heaven beyond, 